Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, we're going to talk about managing teleworkers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome to today's episode. We've got two guests today. We've got Tim Flynn, a retired Rear Admiral of the Navy. Tim, welcome. Thanks, Darren. Great to be here. Um, I support the uh, Navy and Marine Corps account at Intel. Great. And we also have uh, Pete Smith, who's our account exec for Navy. Pete? Thanks, Darren. Nice to be here. I cover our relationship with all the Department of Navy and uh, glad to work with Tim and Darren. Um, today, we're going to focus on um, how COVID-19 is really changing the way that we're working um, and how are we going to manage all these teleworkers that we have? How do we manage all the telework that they need to do? So we first started looking at the way that a lot of our Department of Defense and our public sector workers are working and uh, with, the, with everyone working remote now, what sorts of modes of operation are we starting to see? And um, we came up with some ideas on how we see people working. And uh, here's some of the ideas that we came up with. Uh, VDI for uh, visual display infrastructure. We've got VPN for virtual private networks and also a lot of portal services that are going out there. Have you seen very many of our customers using these techniques, Pete? Are I have. You know, uh, the Department of Navy and uh, the Marine Corps operate both in the, the U.S. CONUS environment, also in the international OCONUS. They have garrison, they have back office, they have a float. So they use the, a combination of these services to connect their remote users. And one thing we have to understand, and I think you brought that up well, Pete, is that they use all different types of modes of operation, not just one person's using one type. So we have to be able to support these different types of operation across a, a, a very number of um, different infrastructure. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So let's dive right in. Let's, let's look at one of the, the ones that we're seeing the most talk about recently, which is VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure. So for those of you who don't understand virtual desktop infrastructure, basically I'm running a session in my data center that I use my laptop to connect to that session where I have a server running. I, I have my whole desktop actually running on a server somewhere. So I can access it from any client device that I have. So there are some issues involved with this. Some of the issues um, have to do with um, the sheer scalability of VDI that they already have in place. I've got to buy more servers, memory, uh, storage for all that, um, as well as um, problems with network and congestion of network. Uh, VDI sessions tend to uh, use a lot of uh, bandwidth. And as you have moved 80% of your workforce out of working in the office and now working remote, uh, VDI sessions can be quite expensive. I would just say uh, important to note that the uh, the endpoints that the users uh, use to access that can vary widely from a, a tablet to, you know, a, a low powered uh, notebook to a high powered notebook. Uh, I think the value is that uh, the data stays in the data center and is not at risk uh, at the endpoint. Right. So that's a very key point. Um, Pete, I like how you said security, all the data is still sitting in the data center. So this is of the three options. This is probably the most secure of them as far as managing data security. Darren, how does this differ from thin client? Well, you could use a thin client here um, to do your VDI session. But as Pete said, we can also do a tablet. We could do a full-blown PC um, desktop or we can do a laptop. So it gives you kind of that flexibility on the client side. All right, the next mode of operation that is probably the most common that we see out there today, which is your device becomes part of your network itself. So using virtual private networks, I can now add my laptop or desktop or even tablet or phone into the enterprise data center network. Um, and this is what um, Intel has been using for years and years. Um, and we're stretching it really thin right now 
with everyone working at home, Intel right now, only essential personnel are allowed um, into the office. So we're really stretching thin our VPN access. Now they do use this in, in the Department of Defense as well, is that correct? I believe it is correct. Correct, Aaron. So, I mean, this, this is a, another mode of operation that can be used. And the good thing about VPN is you can actually have different segments of VPN for different classifications of data as well. So I, I could log on to a more classified network and I have all the protections of that network when I'm doing that. So that also brings up uh, a good thing. There's some downsides to this. I always have to be connected in order to uh, work. Um, and we also now have to manage that data. Remember Pete mentioned, you mentioned earlier, Pete, um, that ability to um, have all my data in the data center, it's more secure. With VPN, we got other issues. But the benefit to the end users, they can, uh, be more mobile uh, if their data is on the go with them and they're in a, uh, a DILS environment, they can keep working and, and connect intermittently. Good point. Now, this also another benefit here is it's not as much network traffic going over the network. So um, it saves you on some bandwidth to your data center, but it still is moving some data. It's not no data. So there's still some network congestion that you have to deal with. All right, the last one is, is an area where we see people moving to even more, and this is using your device as a portal to services. Now, the main, uh, the main service that we see a lot of people moving to is Office 365. And Office 365 gives us the ability to use um, cloud services, right? Instead of our own services, we can use cloud services or services even in our enterprise and we're connecting through multi-factor authentication instead of a VPN, um, and the data can reside in both and is managed um, by the tools themselves on which data goes back and forth between the services. So a lot less um, data is being moved, and, um, but you still need to be connected in order to get backups and things like that happening. Right, when I'm using this, Darren, it feels like could be a you know, uh, a VDI session because uh, it's not running on my PC. It's just displaying it there. But uh, looks like in this case, it's running in the cloud as opposed to the enterprise data center. Yeah, that, it's really interesting because some of them are just using like a web interface. But then also some of them actually have tools that are running on your client as well, whether it's a laptop or desktop. Um, so it's, you're not, you don't have to move all the data you're not sending screens across. It is, you can run somewhat disconnected at times too, which is really kind of slick. And I think that's where the uh, processing power in my edge device uh, becomes more relevant because if I need to have a graphic painted, then it can do that manipulation locally instead of painting it in the cloud and uh, sending all those pixels back to me. So it, I think it's more efficient with the bandwidth connection. No, I, I totally agree. And it, it also means that I can run disconnected if I need to, because um, we're also seeing some network hangups um, in some cases because we are uh, stretching really thin um, the internet right now and bandwidth to a lot of these data centers. So as we're seeing uh, more people move um, to working remotely, we're starting to see some bottlenecks that we knew were always there, but we kind of covered them up uh, by just buying more equipment and things like that. Um, but these are really starting to, to show up as we shifted from about a 20% workforce working remote to closer to 85% of the workforce working remote. There's some huge bottlenecks that are starting to emerge. Well, I guess I've noticed uh, with my Outlook web access uh, as part of the education uh, solution that I didn't really need my VPN to access a lot of these tools. And I'm figuring this out one by one, but I can free up uh, bandwidth for somebody else that might not need it because me using it now would be redundant. You know, um, they've even sent some things out to us um, at Intel to say, watch how much a uh, VPN you really need, do you really need all of it? You know, what, what can you do here to save bandwidth for everyone? 
But Dan, some user traffic may be of a higher priority than other users working remotely. Is there any way to prioritize the traffic of the, uh, the higher priority user? Um, some, of the, some of the more elegant VPN solutions allow you to have priority users, um, but that can be kind of hard to manage. Having 150,000 users um, would be really difficult. So sometimes you can use tools like that. Sometimes you just need to have some policies in place and education of users. Okay. So, but you can see VPN ends up, scala scalability of VPN ends up being a really bo big bottleneck for the first two modes of operation where I'm using VDI or I'm using my uh, desktop or laptop as a device on the network, right? Um, so VPN is, is a major bottleneck there. Another bottleneck we see is just bandwidth overall. And, um, and then the other bo bottleneck that Intel can't really help with with hardware is your IT operations and help desk are being overwhelmed with people for the first time connecting from home, managing things from home can be much more difficult. I think the big aha for me is seeing that scalability through the multi-factor authentication down in the bottom uh, is not in the red. And I can see where the incentive for the enterprise would be to really migrate to that as a way to uh, get more users efficient connectivity to uh, the services they need. Well, and this is one of the tricks. Um, and one of the tips that we have is leveraging cloud service providers network connectivity to your advantage and by hosting things into a cloud service provider you can leverage their network and take some of the bandwidth um, strain off of your own enterprise network um, and push that out to the cloud service providers so let's take a look at some of the the things that we found that help with each one of these four areas of um, bottlenecks that we found. And first is VPN scalability. And we've already kind of mentioned, um, Tim, thank you for that, is the prioritization of user access. You can do that programmatically, and you can also do that through some policies that you've established, like uh, giving priority users access at certain times of the day, or alternating schedules are another way to work through those things. And probably one of the most important things is just employee education. I would think that would be really important, uh, you know, whether you're prioritizing by you know, rank relative uh, in the organization or by the uh, priority of the mission would be a couple of different great ways to, to stack that up. Well, and you also, Pete, you also mentioned some education that you're going through yourself on when to use the VPN, when not to use it. Is that just you're learning it on your own, or did you find any any um, tips that Intel IT has uh, been pushing towards us? You know, interestingly enough, it's been uh, in two uh, two forms. One has just been on the uh, some of the collaboration discussions that our team has had uh, with how to adjust to the new environment, how we all are teleworking, uh, but also uh, I'm starting to read the fine print of some of my SaaS applications, saying, "Hey, you may not need VPN." Uh, once you figure out how to do this, and wasn't too tough to figure out that uh, here are the steps I need to take and I can still get connected. So a good education program can help quite a bit, it sounds like. Darren, it's uh, one of the things that's apparent are some DOD civilians are, are in San Diego in the morning. They're dialing into the Hawaii knock before everyone wakes up in Hawaii. And in the mid-afternoon, they're dialing into the Norfolk knock to try to avoid some of those... Uh, uh, latency issues that occur when there are too many people on one particular knock. Are there ways to automate that so the individual doesn't have to uh, select these uh, supporting knocks themselves? Well, many of the VPN solutions offer load balancing, but they don't typically offer load balancing across um, knocks like that. So today we don't have that capability, but I'm sure um, some of the VPN vendors like Cisco are working on uh, solutions like that today. Great. I wonder if that uh, exists, uh, but it's undocumented. I notice when I use VPN, I can select a site or I can just select Intel network. And I would think that under the option Intel network, that would be the place to put that automation. Yeah, it probably is. Uh, right now, I know it chooses the closest one to you. So maybe, there, maybe there's some smartness that can go into that. All right. On the long term for scalability of VPN, um, people should be looking at moving 
um, up the stack to more of the portal mode of, of your things, you can decrease a lot of your VPN traffic by moving to SaaS uh, solutions, using your laptop more as a portal to those solutions than um, using VPN the whole time. So long-term, this is a, a great uh, way to go. Office 365 or Google Office, those are all um, good options in this space. And I'll bet that within the Navy environment, uh, SaaS applications that are widely deployed would be something like Navy ERP would be kind of low-hanging fruit. That's a great, great example, Pete. All right, let's take a look at bandwidth um, on sites. And this is very much tied to your um, VPN access as well. And here, one of the biggest things that you can do in the short term is to find out how many VDI users you currently have and see if you can move them um, kind of into the working on the network or maybe even to the collaboration tools mode of operation. VDI takes up a lot of bandwidth on your network. And um, if you can figure out ways to um, have your remote workers use one of those other modes, that will help dramatically. Now, another thing that you may have to do is actually increase your network capabilities. Um, and um, we like this in a lot of respects because you're going to be buying equipment um, and we're going to sell more silicon from Intel. So that's good for us but that can take some time um, to actually get that um, put into place. So we always suggest to people, evaluate your remote users and how they're working first. And then another a short term thing, we've talked about education quite a bit. Um, and I think Pete, you came up with this great analogy on the buddy breathing uh, system for scuba. Think of your uh, neighbor and colleague, right? Yeah, so don't go hogging VPN all day long, right? I'm totally guilty of that. I leave it on, I'll go for a walk, and I just chewed up, you know, VPN, um, a, li a license and a network if I had things running in the background, so not good. In the long term, we're suggesting that people really look strongly at a multi-hybrid cloud architecture that um, gives them the ability to leverage cloud service providers for network bandwidth and burstability in these situations that we have and also gives them the ability to optimize for cost and capacity uh, based off of the current working conditions. If you already had a multi-hybrid cloud solution in place, then uh, changing a bunch of people to remote work would probably be pretty easy for you. So you can find out more information on multi-hybrid cloud out on our website, and uh, there's several white papers listed there. And just a brief commercial, it's really a, an enhanced uh, usage of a single cloud like uh, AWS Gov Cloud, if that were your only provider. Uh, this is the concept of ability to move workload from one cloud service provider to the other uh, to take advantage of maybe rate difference, performance difference, and other uh, characteristics. Or, or maybe even on your own private cloud, right, Pete, in your own data center um, and vice versa. So this gives you all that flexibility that you really want. Okay, the other thing we talked a little bit about, and we've got some great reference architectures out there for OWA, which is Outlook Web Access, as a lot of people are moving to that. Uh, we're starting to see um, the infrastructure that is already in place kind of bursting. There's some great reference architectures for that that are available, as well as VDI uh, reference architectures. Um, and we've got several links on our website about this. You should be looking at those. You should be um, uh, re-architecting your solution for scalability in those cases. And that's in the short term. Again, in the long term, we suggest moving to that multi-hybrid cloud infrastructure. As Pete mentioned, it gives you that flexibility of moving between clouds, both public and, and private as you need to. Okay, on the IT operations side, we've come up with some ideas by looking at our own internal IT organization and some external IT organizations. Here we're really concerned about the help desk crew and uh, how we can scale the help desk uh, team. Well, I've noticed uh, from a help desk perspective, uh, there are a couple of different ways to ask questions, right? Uh, the, one, the first one, and maybe we're trying to uh, you know, uh, dilute that or discourage it is, you know, just go right to IT, give them a call, uh, start a chat. But I've noticed in some of my SaaS applications, they have their own 
ask a question, which seems to be a little bit more efficient uh, if I just uh, leverage some of the, the resource capabilities inside a particular application to get quickly to either a set of most frequently asked questions or uh, right to a team that can uh, turn around with expertise a response to my query. So having those online facts end up being uh, quite useful then. Is that what you're saying, Pete? Sure does. I, I'm getting used to a pretty uh, quick SLA and uh, <laughs> back to work, more importantly. I've also noted, uh, you mentioned a little bit of that community contributed um, concept where there's users, there's user groups that are starting to contribute. And I'm starting to see IT organizations kind of embrace that where it's community contributed, but IT monitored or moderated. Um, and that seems to help um, quite a bit as well. There's another um, idea. Also, if your IT organization is not using a ticket managed system, you really should. Um, this will help out dramatically in streamlining, finding where your bottlenecks are in your processes. Another thing that you can do in the short term is you can also uh, work on automating uh, through robotic process automation, so RPAs or additional scripting. Anything that you can simply automate, you should automate to decrease the amount of time your help desk people are doing repetitive tasks. Now at Intel, we also have another solution that might be a little bit longer term for some of the other organizations. And at, at our company, it's called Ask Ivy. And Ask Ivy is an AI, AI bot uh, that helps us with a lot of self-service IT and HR issues that we have. Yeah, again, the nice thing about that is it uh, has a bit of a recommender uh, behind the scenes. So all you have to do is think of a few keywords and uh, the response you get is, uh, if you're looking for information on these topics, uh, and it'll give you some links, but it pretty quickly skinnies down the possible answers uh, without involving you know, a valuable human resource on the other end. People would ask, well, why is Intel really talking about these things? Well, ultimately, we want to see organizations be successful in this really difficult time as we're shifting uh, workers from working in the office, dealing with a lot of stress at home and in their lives and working remote. So Intel really wants to um, help out industry and, and government and public sector quite a bit. And we have silicon that can work in all of these aspects. As you can see, we've got silicon that works in the data center. We've got partners that we use for um, not just delivering hardware, but hardware and, and software solutions through our Intel Select solution. And then we also sell, as many of you already know, um, a lot of PCs, a lot of client devices that actually enable the remote worker to actually get things done. Yeah, another way to look at this, uh, Darren, is that you know, the Department of Navy for a long time has been a very uh, valued and important Intel customer, already owns a lot of the silicon. So Tim and I look at one of our roles uh, as helping Navy uh, learn how they can get the most out of what they've already purchased. So that's why we don't charge for this consultation or advice. It's more guidance based on what we know the capabilities are and how they can help Navy achieve their mission. Thanks for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you liked our episode, go ahead and give us five stars on your favorite podcast or video streaming site. You can also find out more on embracingdigital.com. Until next time, keep moving forward and embrace the digital revolution.